Hello everyone. Welcome to our press conference concerning the war in Afghanistan today. Um, we are gathered here today, October 7th, to denounce 19 years of the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan and a host of other wars and occupations and proxy wars that the U.S. is currently fighting. What we learned from the so-called Afghanistan papers, government documents released through FOIA, is that senior U.S. officials have knowingly lied throughout the war, making optimistic pronouncements of success, even while hiding evidence that the war is a disaster. Despite this, Presidents Obama and Trump have both launched troop surges in an effort to turn the tide of the Afghan war in the U.S. favor. Death and destruction have been the predictable results while the puppet Afghan regime's hold on that country, far from being strengthened, remains as precarious as ever. As with South Vietnam, no U.S. president is willing to admit defeat and leave until there is a worldwide anti-war movement strong enough to force them out. There was a time a few decades ago when U.S. wars would start, wreak devastation on some other country, and then end. Such was the story in Grenada, Panama, the Balkans, Lebanon, and Somalia between 1983 and 1994, 10 years, five wars. Today, U.S. bombings of countries across Northern Africa and Western Asia are so common that they barely are mentioned in the international press. Proxy wars such as the murderous Saudi dictatorship versus Yemen and the collective punishment Israeli blockade and land thefts against Palestinians, these take place without even token condemnation from the White House. Our Congress complicit, is so complicit. With a, with a few exceptions, our Congress is totally complicit. Yet, U.S. support of, victor of vicious dictators, the killing of thousands of people, and the devastation leveled against already poor countries stoke the same resent resentments that gave rise to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. It's become a cliche that people born after September 11, 2001, are now fighting the wars the U.S. launched to avenge that attack. While people in this country do not feel the direct physical effects of these wars, every bomb dropped represents millions of fewer dollars for our schools, for health care, for affordable housing, for public transportation, for physical infrastructure, <coughs> and a myriad of other social services desperately needed in a time when we're undergoing severe economic recession, let alone a pandemic. With one half of the federal discretionary budget of the United States of America going to the military, and much of the rest given over to subsidizing the tax evading already rich, it's little wonder that social services in the world's richest ever nation lag behind those in the rest of the industrialized world. U.S. politicians' support for war and U.S. domination has been and remains thoroughly partisan. The 2020 election will not change that. Today, please listen to the other side of this woefully underreported story as a series of activists will report about the devastating effects of U.S. militarism around the world and possible paths out of this potentially planet impasse. Now to start, um, we have, we are going to hear directly from Afghanistan. We're going to hear the recorded voice of a young woman whose name is Zarguna. And she is a peace activist in Afghanistan. She's going to talk about the U.S. occupation of her country. And Sarah Ball, who is from Voices for Creative Nonviolence, who has visited Afghanistan and Iran, will introduce Zarguna and play her recorded speech.
In the past few years, I have been to Afghanistan twice with Voices for Creative Nonviolence. In both trips, I had the honor and the pleasure of meeting and befriending a brave and wonderful woman named Zarguna. She is a peace activist, a permaculturalist, and a teacher who, in my experience, spends every hour of every day thinking about and organizing on behalf of her people. Her love, passion, and knowledge extend to every person she meets. It would be so much better if I did not have to give this introduction, if she could be with us introducing herself. But as this cannot be, I hope we can all open our ears and remember what she tells us. Hello, my name is Dargona. I am from Afghanistan. I want to tell what the U.S. government did and what they are doing. The U.S. government does not care what the Afghan people needs or wants. They just focus on their purpose, to continue the war. From the time that they came in Afghanistan, there is more and more war. Now everywhere, there is war in Afghanistan. It makes us so tired and there is suffering for us. Here, it's not just Taliban who are killing the people, but the military makes it more and makes the world stronger and more dangerous. They make life hard for us. Every day in Afghanistan, the women, children, and young people are killed by both of them. The U.S. government does not care that people don't need war. We need food, not guns. We need peace, not war. We need education, not drones. We need hospital, not soldiers. We need freedom, not jail or refugees camps. We don't need cooperation. It is a long time that they have been in Afghanistan and expending lots of money for war to make it more. They should know this is not the way to bring peace for this poor country. Thank you, Zarguna. I wish you could hear us. I wish a lot more people could hear you. Now, our next speaker is gonna be Sarah Ball from Voices for Creative Nonviolence. She has visited both Afghanistan and Iran, and she's going to talk about US militarism and our whatever we plan to do in Iran. Sarah. Five months after the September 11th attacks, President Bush announced to the surprise of the State Department and pretty much everyone else that Iran was part of an axis of evil joining North Korea and Iraq. Funnily enough, in the years leading up to 9-11, Iran was in the hands of the reformist President Mohammad Khatami, who was at that time trying to promote a, quote, dialogue of civilizations. The UN even declared 2001 the year of the dialogue civilizations following his suggestion and funnily enough, as is now widely known, after the September 11th attacks, quote, the people of Iran, and the words of Habib Ahmadzadeh, writing for the Tehran Times, humanely mourned for the victims, lit candles for them, and sympathized with their families, end quote. Earlier this year, Mike Pence justified the killing of Iran's General Soleimani by falsely tying him, and thus Iran, to the September 11th attacks. What is going on here? The U.S. and Iran have a long and complicated history, but it is the U.S. that has ousted their democratically elected prime minister, the U.S. who has twisted the arm of countries around the globe into sanctioning or ordinary Iranians until they cannot get the medicines they need, and the U.S. that has reneged on its treaties. It was the U.S. who clandestinely supported both sides in the tragic eight-year Iran-Iraq war, strewing confusion on both sides. Clearly, the U.S. has a problem. The U.S., some have said, pursues a policy of surplus imperialism in which, and I quote the writer Richard Beck, it is not enough for America to be the most powerful country in the world. It must be the most powerful country by such a disproportionate margin that the very idea of anyone else overtaking it is unthinkable, end quote. The U.S. is not responsible for everything Iran does, and of course Iran has its own problems. Who really knows if the conservative Ahmadinejad would have been president were it not for the hostile turn of the U.S. toward Iran and the invasion of Iraq? 
But ironically, the U.S. does indeed behave as if it alone is responsible for what every other country does, including Iran, even while it is killing civilians through its policies the world over. The Iranian people, as all peoples do, desire self-determination. That is precisely what it is not getting in the stranglehold that the U.S., Israel, and Saudi Arabia are imposing on it. In early 2019, Sean Reynolds and I represented Voices for Creative Nonviolence as part of a Code Pink-led delegation to Iran. For five days, we were taken on tours of businesses, universities, centers of government, and even had plenty of time to wander around and talk to people in courtyards and street corners by ourselves. We were plied with tea and talked to openly about world affairs. The memory that keeps coming back to me is the panel discussion we attended at Tehran University with many, mostly female PhD students in Middle Eastern studies holding forth. They were as savvy, knowledgeable, and passionate a group of people as I've ever met. Many were wearing a conservative hijab. They had no time for the US or any other country's blustering, ignorant interference in their country's affairs. Take care of issues in your own country, one woman said. If you don't, you will not understand issues in either. The students, as I recall, were also quite familiar with John Bolton's threat in 2018 against the International Criminal Court on the topic of U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. We will sanction the judges, they quoted him. The U.S. is currently trying to push for so-called snapback sanctions on Iran on top of the already crushing sanctions that have prevented Iran from fighting COVID effectively on top of everything else. The UN Security Council has pointed out the obvious fact that it was the US who withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal and thus cannot reimpose sanctions that were part of the terms of that deal. The Iranian people have been under sanctions for more than 40 years. The rest of the world feels powerless to help Iran, anticipating being sanctioned themselves by the US. Iran had more than a million people pour out onto the streets to mourn the death of General Soleimani. Contrary to what some choose to believe, they are not on the verge of starting a revolution against their own government, especially when it is the U.S. that has been relentlessly pursuing them for so many years. Don't Iraq Iran. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, now we're going to Palestine. We have Samir Hawaida from the Palestinian Youth Movement. Samir. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Samara Waida. I am a member of the Palestinian Youth Movement. And today I'm here to talk about Palestine and how Palestine is the epicenter and oftentimes one of the largest, um, uh, one of the largest proxy wars at times. Particularly, I want to talk about Gaza because Gaza is rarely mentioned in US media as a humanitarian crisis. I'm going to throw out some statistics. The population of Gaza is 1.6 million and over 50% of that 1.6 million are youth under the age of 18 years old. 50% of Gazans live in poverty. 26% of the Gazan workforce, including 40% of the youth, are unemployed. When I throw out these statistics, I want people to understand that there are human lives behind these numbers. There are innocent brown and black lives behind these numbers. The war on Palestine and the war of, on Gaza and is, a, is an extension of US imperialism in the Middle East. Israel is not just a state, it is a military base. It functions as a military base for, oper for US operations in the Middle East. I argue that it's the largest military base in the world. It receives $3.5 billion of our foreign aid, the largest by far in the entire world. And not only that, Israel is also one of the, is the only country in the world that takes U.S. foreign aid and invests it into its own economy. Israelis get to have universal health care, while poor, poor working class black and brown communities in the U.S. get no health care. In the middle of a world, in, in the middle of a pandemic that has killed over a million people worldwide, over 210,000 uh, innocent American lives. Israelis get to live comfortably with our tax paying money um, by having universal health care while we get nothing. That is especially true for Palestinians in the West Bank and Palestinians in Gaza who have fundamentally no form of health care because the Israeli government robs them of that. 
It's not that it doesn't allow them to have health care during a pandemic. It's that it robs them of it. I want to continue a little bit to talk about resources and statistics. One of the biggest uh, forms of resources on this planet is what I like to call the solvent of life, water. Water is robbed from indigenous populations. It's robbed from indigenous people on reservations on U.S. land that is their own land. It is robbed from indigenous people in Canada, which is also a settler colonial entity. And it's robbed from Palestinians and the West Bank. And it's robbed from Palestinians in Gaza. And it is given to settlers with impunity. Another statistic that I want to share is that about one third of the items in the essential drug list in uh, Gaza are not allowed. One third. So when we talk about health care and we talk about the right to human life, we need to understand that people aren't begging or asking for it, whether it be in Gaza or whether it be in Afghanistan. People are demanding it. And if you care, if you care about children being in cages, if you think that it's inhumane, and if you think that it's wrong, then you need to expand your definition of what a cage is. Because Gaza is an open air prison. It is a cage where people are shoved into. Afghanistan is a cage where innocent people are shoved into. And it's funded by U.S. taxpaying money. So we need to take back that money and it belongs to black and brown people in this country because we built this country and we deserve universal health care and we deserve reparations. Palestinians deserve, deserve reparations. People in Afghanistan diver, deserve reparations. And on top of that, we reserve repatriation. This land belongs to indigenous people. Palestine belongs to Palestinians and Afghanistan belongs to Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Samer. Another Palestinian youth is with us today. She is from the USPCN, the United US Palestine Community Network. Gloria, please. Hello, my name is Gloria Msih Petrelli. I'm a member of the US Palestinian Community Network. I was six years old when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan. In those 19 years, we have seen the U.S. spend over $2 trillion to fund the deaths of an estimated 300,000 Afghan and Iraqi people. We've seen Syria and Yemen razed to the ground. We've seen a new era of surveillance and a rise of xenophobia and dangerous white-wing populism all across the world. When you close your eyes and really listen, when you shut off your phone and divest from capitalism for just a moment, you can hear the cries of horror from every corner of the globe. Can you imagine if we all did that for just five minutes every day, quietly parse through our own complicity in the state of the world, owned up to passively or actively bolstering the U.S. war machine and to begin to deal with not only the trauma we have caused, but what we have inherited. It does not serve the U.S. war machine to allow time and space for that. Our system is designed to be able to live so that to be able to live and breathe and exist and feed our families is to engage in capitalism. There's no time to think about 300,000 lost human souls on behalf of greed and fear because if we actually did, there would be no wars. Arunhati Roy says, along with protests and demonstration, wars will only be stopped when soldiers refuse to fight, when workers refuse to load weapons onto ships and aircraft, when people boycott the economic outposts of empire that are strung across the globe. I happen to agree with her. And I've been obsessed with how we empower people to reject American dogma and how we can actually make things better and different. The more I think about it, the only path forward seems to be a true internalization of the belief that a radical future is possible and the understanding of the sacrifice it will take to get there. As a Palestinian American, I have no choice but to believe in radical future. My Tata and Sido did not survive the violent expulsion from their village so I could give up on the promise of liberation. Woo! We have lost so much of our land, culture, and dignity so my community could simply shrug their shoulders and fall in line. Empowering sustainable, sustainable radical hope isn't easy though. Every dollar we spend is stretched to support oppression across the world. Every lawmaker stands to benefit from the preservation of U.S. empire. 
But as this pandemic has brought us to our knees and shown light on the rot we have confused for ground to stand on, we know that more than ever, that forever exists in a vacuum and that no norm is guaranteed. I beg you, on behalf of Palestinians and Iraqis and Afghans and Chicanos and black folks and Venezuelans and Filipinos and every oppressed siblings, reject the norm of American apathy. We can no longer use the guilt of living in this country as the ceiling for our imagination for a better future. Woo! We can let it inform how we build that world. We can come together for community healing and decide what that looks like. We can build a world that is black, brown, queer, trans, a world that is liberated. Woo! We can invest in the decolonization of not only our land, but our minds. We reject the idea of American individualism and pour our hearts and minds into community by sharing wealth, joining organizations, and centering love and joy along the way. The forever wars have shaped all of our lives, irreparably harmed our Mother Earth, stolen hundreds and thousands of her children. We are now at the precipice of the greatest choice we've ever had to make as people. And I invite you to use the balm of Mahmoud Darwish's words to help you make it. Deviate with all your might. Deviate from the rule. From now on, your only guardian is a neglected future. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Marsha Bernstein. She comes from two organizations, from the Chicago Committee Against War and Racism and from Chicago Area Peace Action. Marsha, please. She'll talk about the U.S.-Saudi war in Yemen. Good morning, or afternoon, I guess we're at. So, the conflict in Yemen is one of many conflicts that never hits the news in the U.S., rarely hits the news internationally. Yemen is one of the most impoverished nations on the face of the earth. And the conflict in Yemen is well into its sixth year. The United Nations has warned about the acuteness of the war's biggest humanitarian emergency gripping the Arab country, owing to a multi-sided fighting that has not yet subsided despite intervention by global powers and international organizations. Unfortunately, at a time of untold human suffering, the Trump administration has made drastic cuts to international aid in Yemen, including the suspension of $73 million in USAID assistance to Houthi-controlled territories, territories in northern Yemen, where currently 80% of the population lives. The, the combined death toll from the conflict, including hunger, disease, lack of health facilities, has well surpassed 235,000, well nearly 20 million people, representing 70% of the population, suffer from severe hunger, including 2 million children under the age of 5 who are critically malnourished. Saudi Arabia, along with a coalition of nine other Arab countries and the US and the UK, France, etc., have waged a massive, prolonged military campaign in Yemen to in curb the insurgence of the Houthis. Western powers have been supplying weaponry to Saudi Arabia in big proportion, which it has used in its incursion into crisis-stricken Yemen. The United States has, has been exporting billions of dollars worth of transport planes, combat aircraft, precision-guided bombs and tanks manufactured by Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Chicago's Boeing, and General Dynamics to Saudi Arabia in defiance of congressional resolutions blocking such sales. The Saudi-led coalition of Yemen has received almost unwavering military support and weapon sales from the UK, US, France, and other Western countries. At the start of the uh, March 2015, 2015, sorry, the Obama administration was simultaneously negotiating the JCPOA, commonly known as the Nuclear Iran Deal. 
This dim diplomatic agreement was largely opposed by Saudi Arabia as they feared the prospect of the U.S. and Iran moving closer together in what could mean a U.S.-Saudi alliance with their own regional ambitions. When Trump took office, the support continued despite the fact that Yemen had become the world's greatest humanitarian crisis. According to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, nearly 80% of the Yemeni population are in need of some sort of humanitarian assistance. What is clear is that the unilateral ceasefires will not work and that military complicity from international community is perpetuating this violence. The Yemeni people need help now. They need to have their country back. They need to have no more international, what, interference? Yes. The Yemeni country believes to the, belongs to the Yemeni and they need to be able to solve their own issues. Thank you. Um, I just have to interject this. What was it, last summer, a bunch of us met here in this federal plaza. Kathy Kelly from Voices for Created Nonviolence organized an event. This was shortly after 43 little kids in Yemen were slaughtered. Um, and they had just been given backpacks. It was like a prize and they were going on a field trip and they were slaughtered. So we had 43 backpacks out here to commemorate that. There was nobody else here. We live in the United States of Amnesia. Okay, I gotta get off my high horse. Now, today we have Minelli from Anakbayan, Chicago a Filipino-American organization, and she's going to talk about U.S. military intervention in the Philippines, which I can tell you from having read a book by Daniel Immerwar called How to Hide an Empire. The history of American intervention in the Philippines is horrendous. Minnelli, thank you. y'all. From Afghanistan to the Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. Kamusta? My name is Jamie Nellis Carras. I'm from Anakbay, Chicago, a youth and student-led organization for national liberation and genuine democracy in the Philippines. As Anakbay, Chicago, we stand in solidarity with the people from Afghanistan who suffered at the hands of youth imperialism and militarism for 19 years and ongoing. We recognize that the U.S. aggression towards Afghanistan and the Middle East do not exist in isolation. Since World War II, the reactionary forces in the United States has intervened in countries around the, around the world, and we as Filipino youths are very much aware of the U.S. imperialism and aggression at our home. We recognize that the U.S. aggression towards Afghanistan and the Middle East do not exist in isolation. Since World War II, the reactionary forces in the United States has intervened in countries around the, around the world, and we as Filipino youths are very much aware of the U.S. imperialism and aggression at our home. During the Filipino-American War, about a million of Filipinos were killed using the same torture techniques used in the Middle East. Under the guise of counterinsurgency, the U.S. and the current Filipino President Duterte now has to work closely to uphold the U.S. regime. They have targeted activists and freedom fighters who continually fight against the U.S. and its Filipino puppet government. And this has intensified with the recent passing of the anti-terror bill, which allowed police and military warrantless arrest to individuals critical of the government. When people are already angry and afraid about how the government handled the COVID crisis, Duterte and his students decided to sign a bill to silence them instead. They have also targeted minority groups, such as the indigenous groups in the Philippines, such as um, the Lumas drew militarization of their school and communities because they wanted their land for mining and logging. We know that the current puppet government does not have our intention of our Filipino people at heart. This was disgustingly played out when the Filipino court released the murderer, U.S. Marine Joseph Scott Pemberton, who violently 
murdered a Filipina trans woman. Jennifer Aladdin, six years ago, despite admitting that he killed her, he was only sentenced six years of imprisonment while serving his jail time comfortably inside Campa Ganado. His release is not only a massive slap to Jennifer's family, it further cemented the Philippine government continues submission to U.S. imperialism. Justice for Jennifer and other victims of U.S. wars and aggression is only served if, if we seek to end U.S. imperialism and all of its puppet regimes. We as Anagbai know that we as you must continually agitate, organize and mobilize the masses to fight the real enemy of the people. And that's the U.S. war machine. We must end the forever war of Afghanistan and all U.S. militarization around the world. We must say no to paying our taxes to funding fascist dictators like President Duterte and wars abroad. Just one of the ways that you and your organization can do that is to endorse the Philippine Human Rights Act, which will cut U.S. military aid to the Philippines after the human rights reforms are passed. We say no to wars and occupation, relocate the money for jobs, free health care and education for all. Yeah! Alec by Chicago urges you all to join the people's struggle around the world to choose revolution over proxy wars, the mass U.S. capitalist imperialist greed, and to finally end the Ryan system and fight for liberation for all. From Afghanistan to the Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. Yeah! Stop. Yeah. Okay, we're going from the Philippines now to a really unpopular and complicated subject, the Korea, Penin Korean Peninsula, with David Phelps, who is from the Chicago Committee Against War and Racism. David? Good afternoon. My name is David Phelps. Uh, I'm from the Chicago Committee Against War and Racism. Uh, though some historians have argued that the Korean War started as early as 1945, to most people, to most people in the U.S., the Korean War started in June 1950. The fighting in that war was suspended on July 27, 1953, with just an armistice. The U.S. is still technically at war with North Korea. The conflict between the U.S. and North Korea may be the longest of forever wars. In response to North Korea developing a miniaturized nuclear weapon that could be placed upon a missile, on August 8, 2017, Donald Trump threatened that North Korea will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Trump claimed that North Korea was threatening the world with 60 nuclear weapons. But what about the gigantic U.S. nuclear stockpile of 6,185 nuclear weapons? Then, in a speech to the U.N., Donald Trump screamed that the U.S. would totally destroy North Korea. Basically, he was threatening to wipe 25.5 million people off the face of the earth. In his recent book, Rage, Bob Woodward said that Trump told Woodward that he didn't know how close we were to war with North Korea. The Secretary of Defense at that time, James Mattis, went to church a lot to pray, fearing a nuclear conflict. The U.S. came close to going to war with North Korea, a nuclear armed state. The first strike on North Korea would likely be followed by retaliation from both North Korea and China. Even a limited nuclear war would have devastating consequences. Besides killing tens of millions of people, fires from the nuclear bombs would throw enough soot into the atmosphere to block sunlight. It would create a nuclear winter that could destroy crop production on the planet for 50 to 60 years. Fortunately, President Moon Jae-in of South Korea started diplomatic efforts towards peace. President Moon started diplomacy at the 2018 Winter Olympics with inter-Korean talks. They had talks even without the U.S. Then, President Trump and Chairman, Chairman Kim Jong-un signed a joint statement starting the peace process. But that peace process broke down in February 2019 at a summit in Hanoi, Vietnam. Trump botched the job on diplomacy with North Korea. Trump didn't focus enough on having the necessary number of working level talks. Um, there should be like a series of trade-offs uh, to get to peace. Instead, Trump wanted to go for a big deal. Mike Pompeo and John Bolton also sabotaged the Korean peace process at every opportunity. They shifted the goalposts, demanding North Korea give up its chemical and biological warfare program, ballistic missile launchers, and associated facilities. This is with no guarantees 
uh, of security from the U.S. and the U.S. keeping its nuclear umbrella in the region. During the Korean War, the U.S. killed over two million Koreans. That's one-fifth of the population of the country. No nation state with a history such as North Korea's would agree with to, to what Bolton and Trump were demanding. What if Trump is re-elected and North Koreans start another missile test or more nuclear tests again? What if Trump starts up with a fire and fury rhetoric again? What could happen is unthinkable. President Moon and Kim Jong-un were willing to negotiate for peace and reunification on the Korean Peninsula. This is a possible historical opening that could be squandered by a possible Biden presidency. In a campaign speech this year, Biden has taken a more belligerent stance in North Korea, attacking Trump from the right by saying, I make it clear that we're going to move our defenses up as we did before, and we're going to make sure we have the capacity to deal with it in the near term. It's been reported that a Biden administration will appoint Michelle Flournoy, a former Pentagon official, to be Secretary of Defense. Flournoy also co-founded the Center for a New American Security, which was a champion of the forever war in Afghanistan when Obama was president. The Center for a New Security is funded by defense contractors, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and in particular Lockheed Martin, which manufactures missile defense systems for use in South Korea. In a recent interview, when asked about North Korea, Flournoy said, we need defenses to give us an ultimate defense against that North Korean nuclear cap capability, should they master it. Here she's proposing more costly military spending and an anti-missile system made by Lockheed Martin. This spending is in addition to the cost of over 81 military bases in the South, stationing 28,000 troops there. Do we want billions of our tax dollars going for this during a pandemic and a depression? What does this tell us? Just voting for a politician isn't enough. We need a mass anti-war movement like we had during the Vietnam War to achieve peace. Thank you. Wow, I told you it was going to be complicated. Okay, now we have, from Latin America, we have Victoria Cervantes from La Voz de los de Abajo. It's a Honduran solidarity organization, and she's going to speak generally about the mess we are making in Latin America. Thank you, Vicky. Hi, my name is Victoria Cervantes from La Voz de los de Abajo, Chicago, and the Honduras Solidarity Network in North America. A 16-year-old boy is thrown off a bridge in Chile by the military police. Thousands of Honduran refugee migrants are tear gassed and beaten by Honduran military and Guatemalan military as they attempt to flee their country. Hundreds of Colombian and Honduran and Bolivian activists are assassinated. What do these things have in common? And what do they have in common with everything that's been said today so far? The United States government is what they have in common. In Latin America, Latin America is an example of such a long-term, endless, forever, and permanent site of intervention, interference, and militarism on the part of the U.S. that crosses Democrats, Republicans, all administrations for so many years. Right now, it continues. The U.S. government, through implicit and explicit military threats, through military interventions with troops, and even more importantly in the 21st century through the training, arming, financing, and providing logistical support for militaries belonging to dictatorships that the U.S. has helped to install in Latin America is carrying out massacres, robbing the people's resources, and destroying what little democracy and people's will has existed in Latin America. The U.S. provides political and military support for dictatorships. It supports coups, political, and I say that entre comillas, as they say in quotes, and military across Latin America. Right now in Colombia, it's the U.S., the same U.S. policies are working hand in hand with the Colombian military, right wing, and paramilitary to destroy the peace process in Colombia that attempts to end decades of armed conflict. 
In Honduras, they support, they are the main and probably the key support for a narco dictatorship led by Juan Orlando Hernandez that they helped install through the coup that began in 2009 and continues today, and that is assassinating indigenous leaders and environmentalists across the continent. In Cuba and Venezuela, using both explicit and implicit military threats, the U.S. is carrying out sanctions against the people of those countries. And in the case of Venezuela, the U.S. is using warships to threaten Venezuela, to cut off their resources, and these are attacks against the people by the U.S. But all of this is still met in Latin America by a forever and endless and permanent resistance. The people of Latin America are fighting from Bolivia to Chile to Honduras, across the whole continent, to change the system, yes. to overthrow U.S. interference, intervention, and occupation, and to create a continent that functions for the people. Yes. A continent where the people control their resources and how to use them for their own benefit. Yes. This is what's happening, and for that reason, we need to fight to cut off all U.S. aid, training, and support for the Latin American militaries that are supporting dictatorships. Yes! We need to fight that the U.S. cuts off all political support for dictators like Juan Orlando Hernandez. This is our role here, and as they say in Honduras, are you tired? No, because the struggle continues, the struggle continues. Yes! an endless stream. Now we have a talk from Neil Resnikoff from the Chicago Anti-War Coalition to talk about superpower rivalry. So Chicago Anti-War Coalition is also known as COC. As you, as you may know, representatives of the U.S. ruling class have been making war preparations for possible war with China. COC thinks this is something that we the people need to be taking more action against. In case you're not clear about the situation, I'll give it briefly. The U.S. military has 400 bases and nuclear weaponry all around China. The preparation for war with China is in case other methods don't work to knock out China's business interests out of competition with the U.S. banks and corporations. China's competing hard, especially in lucrative Asia and in Latin America and Africa. That is, the profit-seeking capitalist ruling class in the U.S. wants to run everything in order to make maximum profits. They're worried about competition with China's ruling class for control of raw materials, labor power, and markets. Spokespeople for various factions in the U.S. ruling class have made the aims clear that the U.S. government needs a strong military presence in Asia ready to make war against China as needed. Barack Obama, for example, declared himself the first Pacific president. He put the pivot to Asia in place in which 60% of all the U.S. military would go there. As he pointed out, Asia, with nearly half the Earth's population, one-third of global GDP, and some of the world's most capable, capable militaries, is increasingly the world's political and economic center of gravity. His Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, said harassing, harnessing Asia's growth and dynamism is, is central to American economic and strategic interests. One of the keys to doing this is a military presence. Trump said our enduring commitment to the Indo-Pacific is, is demonstrated by a presence of 375,000 U.S. military and civilian personnel. 
Biden says that the U.S. should get tougher on China. And he says the most effective way, with a difference to Trump on this, the most effective way is to build a united front of U.S. allies. And then, necess if necessary, to use force. He says the United States has the strongest military in the world, and he will ensure that it stays that way. So don't we, in the anti-war movement, need to in, in, uh, oppose these war preparations and the spending of our tax money for more war for U.S. empire? And it's done rather than, rather than social needs. Don't we need to oppose the misuse of our youth as cannon fodder for the rich? Don't we need to oppose the war wreckage that would come from a war? Now, some people uh, try to get us to think that China is our enemy, namely the uh, ruling class politicians always repeat that. But the people of China are not our enemy, are they? The ruling class here in the U.S. is in stiff competition with the ruling class of China, but the fight for U.S. ruling class domination is not our fight, is it? No! We don't want to be on the side of U.S. imperialism, do we? No! So don't we need to oppose this fight between the U.S. government and China's government isn't the priority right now for us to defend ourselves against the capitalist ruling class attacks on the people here at home? Yes! And to oppose its warlike actions abroad, including against China. How about if we work to create an anti-war government, one that is of, for, and by the people? Yes! How about power to the people? Yes! yes. Our final speaker today, our final speaker today is going to be Andy Thayer. He comes at, to us with, uh, from the Chicago Committee Against War and Racism and Gay Liberation Network. We're going to look at the presidential candidates and what we can expect from them. To quote John Reed in the film Reds, not much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Timmy. So here we are on the 19th anniversary of the U.S. invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, arguably the beginning of the United States Forever Wars. When I was a young man, or younger man, American wars would start, they'd go for a few years, they'd kill a bunch of people, and then they'd end. But since 2001, we've had endless wars. We've had forever wars. And with each of the presidents in turn, they each seem to be one-upping each other in terms of their atrocities against the peoples of the world. So the CIA kidnappings under George W. Bush, otherwise known as extraordinary renditions, that is an Orwellian speech, I don't know what is, under Obama became drone assassination over and over again on a weekly basis. And then you had Obama's record military package to Israel, which was then one-upped by President Trump moving the embassy to Jerusalem and endorsing Israeli land seizures in a so-called peace deal that was so awful towards the Palestinians that even the quizzling Palestinian Authority government had to reject it. Oh. President Obama launched a nuclear weapons program that at the time was described as, quote, America's single largest public expenditure scheduled for the coming decades, which has grown to two to three trillion dollars. And if that could be one up, well, Trump went there again, only to have uh, the launching of his so-called Space Force, which is a shredding of international treaties regarding outer space. U.S. bombings of other countries have become so routine under the past two presidents that the U.S. press largely doesn't even report about it anymore. Now you can bet that if another country 
lobbed a drone bomb on Davenport, Iowa, let alone Chicago or New York, there would be worldwide press attention about it. Oh, yeah. But this is the arrogance of American exceptionalism, where outrages against other peoples around the world are barely worth comment. But if they're committed against the United States, then all hell breaks loose. Oh, yeah. Now, as others have mentioned, there are hundreds of American military bases around the world. Neil mentioned over 400 in the so-called China Theater, which is the way I guess the military people might refer to it. What would be the reaction of Chicagoans if we had a military base just a few miles away? This is the outrage that most of the world's population feels towards these American military bases. They don't want them there. They don't want U.S. soldiers there. And they sure as hell don't want U.S. warships bristling with weaponry going off, going around their coasts. Oh, yeah! That was part of the one-upping of one party of after another in terms of their threats of war and our endless wars. We have seen a more than doubling of U.S. military expenditure since the year 2000. More than doubling. And here we are in the midst of a pandemic where cities around the country are saying that they need PPE. They need ways to teach our kids in this pandemic. Nurses and other frontline workers have to beg for the basic equipment. And yet, we live in a country that spends as much on its military as almost the rest of the world combined. We live in a country, we live in a city, where 40% of the discretionary budget goes to the police. Well, that's got an international option as well, because 50% of the federal discretionary budget goes to the U.S. military. So don't let them tell you that there aren't, there isn't money for the things that people need. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! I'm going to finish on this. People mentioned the Afghanistan papers that basically laid bare the ugly truth of U.S. imperialism and Afghanistan. The totally venal and corrupt government that the United States supports. The billions of dollars that just go missing. And Chelsea Manning and, 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 and Edward Snowden and Julian Assange also exposed these sort of atrocities in places like Iraq. The question is, why was there not the same change that we saw as we saw a generation ago with the Pentagon Papers and the Vietnam War? Because then there was a worldwide anti-war movement. And that's what we have to build, admittedly from small beginnings here today and in other places around the world, but there's no shortcut, because neither presidential candidate is giving us what we need come November. The endless wars will continue endlessly until we and the people around the world put an end to them. Yeah. Thank you very oh, much. Yeah.